Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first installment of our new unit, which is on the topic of Manifest Destiny, which will answer the essential question, how did the United States expand from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, or as it says in America the Beautiful, from sea to shining sea. This is lesson one, and our focus today is on the Louisiana Purchase. Your essential question for the entire unit that we're about to begin is in the upper right-hand corner. Feel free to press pause and write that down. As we do at the beginning of every lesson, we are going to review important vocabulary so that when I use that vocabulary in the lesson, you will know what I'm talking about. Our first term is manifest destiny. Manifest destiny was the belief that it was America's duty to spread across the North American continent. Uh, the phrase owes its origins to a gentleman by the name of John L. O'Sullivan, who wrote in a newspaper that America had a duty to basically take over the entire continent and that became a very popular idea and ideas have power our second term is diplomacy which is vocabulary word number 34 diplomacy is the practice of conducting negotiations between countries so when the united states negotiates with other countries we are conducting diplomacy Our first left side question for this particular lesson is what happened after the Constitution was passed? We just finished learning about the U.S. Constitution. It was written in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. We didn't talk about the debate, but there was a very long debate in the country about whether or not to approve the new Constitution. Eventually, the people known as Federalists who supported the Constitution won out and the states did approve it. And the anti-federalists, those who wanted to not have such a strong central government, failed in their arguments and then um, accepted eventually the new constitution. However, the federalists and the anti-federalists eventually became the equivalent of our first political parties, which is what we're going to discuss right now. First thing is, as you know, George Washington was our first president, and he is the only president we have ever had who ran unopposed. Uh, both in 1789, the only odd year election in our history, in 1792, George Washington was elected president unanimously in the Electoral College, uh, and he set many of the precedents as president that uh, later came to be... Uh, very important. So imagine being the guy who had to follow George Washington, one of the most revered people in the history of country, the general during the Revolutionary War, basically the father of the new country. Uh, John Adams was that guy. He was the vice president for George Washington. Um, he was elected to succeed George Washington in 1796. Uh, they were both members of what came to be known as the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party believed in a strong central government um, that could do whatever it wanted as long as the Constitution did not say it couldn't do what it wanted. So um, they believed in a lot of strength in the central government. However, John Adams was deeply unpopular. He passed a few laws called the Alien Act and the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act basically said you could throw reporters in jail if they wrote anything about the government that the government didn't like. I'm going to avoid commenting on that right now. Um, that directly defied the First Amendment of the Constitution, and the Supreme Court of the United States actually threw that out. Uh, this made John Adams extremely unpopular, so when the next presidential election came along, there was a pretty strong chance that uh, President Adams might not get reelected. So Thomas Jefferson, uh, who was a member of a party that became known as the Democratic-Republican Party, um, 
which is confusing because we now have two separate parties with those names. But the Democratic Republican Party basically wanted a democratic republic. Uh, they supported a more limited central government that could only do the things the Constitution said they could do and nothing else. And they believed in states' rights, that states should still be very powerful under the new Constitution. So Thomas Jefferson won against President Adams in the election of 1800. And the reason this is significant is because we created our Constitution, we created our democracy that we could actually change leaders uh, when we didn't like them. And that was the entire point of creating our system of government. But this is the first time we actually did that. So in 1800, it's the first time the people decided, you know what, we don't like who's leading us, we're going to choose somebody else. And it was the first time our new constitution was put to the test, and it worked. Switching to the next slide. So our next left side question is, what was the Louisiana Purchase? Up until this point, we've been talking about the original 13 colonies that became the 13 states. Uh, when we learned about the Articles of Confederation, we learned about how any uh, territory that had more than 60,000 people could apply to become a state. We haven't talked about it directly, but in the uh, time in between, Vermont has become a state. Um, I believe Ohio has become a state. So some of those states in that Ohio River Valley area that we fought over in the French Indian War started to become states. I think Kentucky had become a state at this point, but uh, we were still a country that went only to the Mississippi River. The original Treaty of Paris that gave us our independence from the British uh, basically said the boundaries of the country only go to the Mississippi River. So the Louisiana Purchase changed all of that. In 1803, President Jefferson actually wanted to buy New Orleans from France for $10 million. But Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte said, you know what? We won't just give you the city of New Orleans. We'll give you the entire territory of Louisiana for $15 million. A little background here. The United States wanted New Orleans because it was the gateway to the Mississippi River. And it was pretty much the only part of the Mississippi River that was not controlled and within the territory of the United States. We basically wanted control of the river from start to finish. And by having New Orleans, we would have that. Napoleon was busy trying to take over the world, specifically Europe, and he needed money. And his attitude was, well, you know what? I'll pay, uh, I'll, I'll take the 15 million from the United States right now and after I'm done conquering Europe, I'll just sail across the ocean and conquer the United States, and it won't matter. But um, there was something called Waterloo, and uh, Napoleon was not able to live out that vision, shall we say. So Louisiana Purchase encompassed portions of 14 current U.S. states and two Canadian provinces. It was huge. This was the Louisiana Purchase. I am circling it with my cursor. It was gigantic. It basically doubled the size of the United States. Uh, it was 828,800 square miles of what was French territory, um, although the French didn't have anybody living there or controlling it. They basically had taken it from Spain when Spain was weak. But uh, basically, it doubled the size of the United States. So we had purchased all of this new territory but we didn't really know much of anything about it, which is uh, kind of the interesting part. Hold on to that thought. Switching to the next slide. So why was the Louisiana Purchase controversial? Apparently I didn't get my uh, special effects correct on this slide, but that's okay. Um, it was controversial because of President Jefferson himself and what he said he believed when he was running for president versus what he was confronting, confronted with when he actually was president. And this is not unusual. It's one thing to campaign. It's one thing to say what you believe in. But as you actually face leading and face the circumstances of your tenure in office, you sometimes have to confront reality and be a bit pragmatic. 
Um, that is what President Jefferson had to do. As a Democratic Republican, Jefferson only believed the government should do only what the Constitution said it could do. So if the Constitution didn't give the government specific power to do a specific thing, President Jefferson was of the opinion the government could not do that thing. So the Constitution makes no mention of purchasing territory from another nation through a treaty. Uh, it does give the president the right to negotiate treaties. It does give the Senate the power to ratify treaties, but it does not say you can take over territory from another country if you sign a treaty with that country. So you could make that argument both ways, and that's exactly what happened. The Senate had to debate this treaty that President Jefferson signed with France to buy Louisiana for $15 million. Um, and the debate was, do, does the Constitution give us the power to do this or not? In the end, 24 senators voted to say yes. Yes, it does. We will accept this treaty and double the size of the country. Only seven senators said no. The uh, Constitution does not give us this power. We do not want this. So there's all kinds of issues that... Uh, came out of this, and um, I'll just throw one of them out there, slavery. What was going to happen in all this new territory was slavery. Slavery was the issue that was still dividing the country very badly. Remember the three-fifths compromise. And so this only made that worse. And we will be talking about that in a future unit. So you may have heard about the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Uh, this was a legendary expedition where Lewis and Clark were sent by President Jefferson. By the way, their names are Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. We don't name men Meriwether anymore. I don't know why that is. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark were sent to explore all the new territory and uh, to essentially let Native Americans know... Uh, you're, you're now in the territory of something called the United States of America, which was news to the Native Americans. That, that's uh, not something they, they had any awareness of. Um, they encountered many Native Americans. They discovered many new species of plants and animals. They crossed the Rocky Mountains for the first time, and they made it to the Pacific coast of Oregon. Fort Clatsop, if you've ever been out to the coast and seen Fort Clatsop, that is where Lewis and Clark spent the winter. And it was one of the rainiest winters on record. Um, what, one of the things they did, they kept extremely detailed journals of their daily activities, and they made extremely accurate maps of where they were traveling. So, you know, the United States purchased this territory, had no idea what it was like. Basically, Lewis and Clark were sent out there to find out what this new territory was like and to keep the most accurate records possible of that new territory. And they did a very, very good job. Even though their boat capsized, I mean, they had to do a lot of things just to preserve these records because they were facing some pretty arduous um, circumstances. One of the things they did help do is establish America's claim to the land west of the Louisiana Purchase boundary because the Louisiana Purchase only went to the Rocky Mountains. Once Lewis and Clark went west of the Rocky Mountains, they were entering territory that was still in dispute. We'll talk about that in our next lesson. And that territory includes a place that we might be familiar with called Oregon. Um, so the Corps of Discovery, which is what Lewis and Clark's expedition was called, they were called the Corps of Discovery, uh, returned to St. Louis, which is where it started, on September 23rd, 1806. It was a two and a half year journey, folks. Imagine walking and being in a canoe from here all the way to here and back and having that take you two and a half years. That's a different level of endurance than uh, we're used to in today's world, I would dare say. Uh, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap up this first lesson of this unit. And as you know, whenever we do that, we always write a summary. So I'm going to invite you to write a five to eight sentence summary of today's lesson. I want you to answer the following questions with your summary. If you answer these questions, chances are you're going to have a very good summary. 
First, why was the election of 1800 significant? Second, what did the Louisiana Purchase accomplish? Third, why was it controversial for President Jefferson to approve the purchase? And finally, what was important about the Lewis and Clark expedition? I've got a little box there that shows what a good summary does and does not do. I like that box, so I put that in there. And uh, you know how this works because you know how my expectations are when it comes to writing summaries. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of lesson one of this unit. And in our next lesson, we're going to discuss a place called Oregon. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Blumendahl signing off until next time on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube Network.